Today, I want to continue from where we were last week in Philippians. I'm going to stay there. I want to read more specifically from Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to give you a good chunk of scripture just to give us some context. Don't worry, I'm not going to preach the whole passage, but I'm going to give you some background to put you into the picture of what Paul is trying to present to the Philippian church. He says this in verse 2, look out for those dogs. I love that. That would be the most epic sermon title. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks they have reason for confidence in the flesh, I got more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on Him, on faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and share in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me His own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of which is up of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything, if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. I'm very excited about the Word of God today. As we continue in our series, I want to preach to you from the subject, call me crazy, but I can't stop now. I do believe God's going to bless you with the Word of God. So as you prepare your hearts today, find your favorite mother around you and just give them a little bit of a side hug, acknowledge them, shake their hand, or just tell them thank you for all that you do. Would you do that real quick? Thank you for all that you do. Amen, amen, amen. Make sure they're a mother. So I tweeted this week. It's been a minute, but maybe it was because I wanted to get one in before uh, Elon hands over the CEO ship to somebody else. I just wanted to get one in, and it's interesting because uh, it got two likes and one comment, <laughs> but I expected it, to be honest with you. I expected the moment I put the tweet out, I'm like, this ain't going to get engagement, and maybe in a minute I'll tell you why, because... Uh, I found a funny, I have a funny relationship with social media. I have a fascination with it more than I enjoy it. I'm interested in the dynamics that social media plays within our society. And uh, I like to draw philosophical conclusions, but I also like to break it down by generation on how each generation uses social media. You'd be fascinated to actually have the revelation. Maybe this might be revelatory to you today. Given your generation, you will approach social media from a different perspective, the same platform, but from a different perspective. In fact, let's do an exercise. How many uh, baby boomers would we say are in the house? You're a baby boomer in the house. Any, Any baby boomers here? Be proud, guys. Come on, just wave it up high. Wave it up high. Come on, let's give it up for the baby boomers in the house. What you need to know about boomers and the way that they approach social media is Social media to boomers is predominantly for keeping up with the family. That's what they're there for. They're like, I don't care about all this other stuff on there. Just show me pictures of my grandkids. Just show me the pictures. I want to see the grandkids. That's all they care about on social media. So feed them, all right? Post pictures for your grandparents. Do we have any Gen Xs here? The first service were way more proud. Any Generation X, any, anybody alongside me, Generation X, let's stand up, stand up, because you can still. All right, while you can stand, <laughs> while you can still stand, look at you. Amazing. Look at these Gen Xs. Also known as the tithers in the church. Anyway, uh, <laughs> G- 
Gen X says, the way they use social media is a space for confrontation and conspiracy theories. Am I wrong? It's all right. Any millennials in the house of the Lord Jesus today? You don't even need to ask them to stand. Millennials treat social media like an archive for your life's best moments. Little carefully curated catalog of epic moments, the paradise, the beach moments, the driver's license, you know, the, the, the stuff, the stuff. And uh, where's my faithful Gen Z is at? The emerging generation. You can argue with me, but apparently Gen Z mainly use social media for trend awareness, to stay up to date. I feel like I'm not getting any love from youth now, from Vox Gen. But they need to stay up to date. They need to know the latest lingo, the latest fashion, and that's where they get it from is social media. What's interesting is knowing that I'm a a Gen X generation, it's no surprise that my tweet didn't get much engagement. Because what I put on Twitter is this. I said, it's not confrontation that corrupts the Christian's faith. It's comfort. Say it again. Three likes. Because I got one in service. I'll say it again. It's not confrontation that corrupts the Christian faith. It's comfort. See, so often in the Christian faith where we think it's something confrontational that's going to come against our faith, that's going to corrupt our faith, some opposition that's going to corrupt our faith, but it's not confrontation, it's comfort. Comfort is the cancer to the Christianity, to be comfortable, to, to stagnate. Now, I want you to keep that in mind for a moment as we unpack what Paul is presenting to us as the church through this passage in Philippians, because as an apostle, Paul had a past. In fact, you could say that Paul had come a long way because at the time of writing this letter to the church, it had been 30 years since his salvation experience. For 30 years, he had been building the church. And in that time, he had won or or overcome some spiritual battles. And in this particular section of Scripture, we find him presenting the very notion of one thing he does. Now, out of all the things that Paul does, if Paul's going to present to us, there's one thing I do, I would dare say that is worthy of us paying more attention to. Would you agree? Like like if if you're at college and your professor says, out of everything I've taught you, remember this. That's the time to dial in. Like if you're, if you're, if you're going for a pilot's license, right? And, and your instructor is like, yeah, a lot of stuff I've taught you was good, but this one thing, pay attention to. How many people are pay, taking extra attention to that one thing? This is what the apostle is doing. He says this one thing I do. He's not saying I don't do anything else, but he's saying I give priority to this. He says this one thing I do for God getting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Let me ask, how many people got a past? Not many. All right, let me be more specific. (laughs) How many people have a past they'd like to forget? Better still, a past you'd like your neighbor to forget. (laughs) All right, now we're talking. Paul most certainly had one of these two. Believe it or not, prior to his dramatic salvation experience on the moment that he was on the road to Damascus, where Paul, who at that time was named Saul, was actually actively working against the church. And do not be misled. This does not mean he was writing negative Yelp reviews about the church. He wasn't watching sermons on YouTube and critiquing the pastor's outfit. That's not what he was doing in working against the church, he was actively responsible for putting to death anybody who professed Jesus as Lord. This was his past. This was his job. This is what he was doing. That was his background. And this was, in many ways, the image that a lot of people had of Paul who were now trying to accept him as an apostle. So Paul had a past. Paul had a a background that I'm sure... One would love to forget. However, the past that Paul is talking about here, the kind of past he's asking or telling that he chooses to forget is less in reference to his failures and actually more focused on his seeming successes. You see, it's easy to fall into the trap to thinking that our hardships are what hinder our progress. 
It's actually not the case. I mean, let's consider the way Paul viewed hardships because the way he speaks about them almost makes him seem crazy. For example, as we discovered earlier in this series in 2 Corinthians, he gives us a long list of the hardships that he faced. He includes in their beatings and shipwrecks. He talks about the rejection, which in the end, he says, all works to glorify God. In Romans 5, he talks about rejoicing in suffering. In the first chapter of Philippians, he talks about the blessing of persecution. Even in his perspective of prison, it was that, that it served the purpose of advancing the gospel. You see, to Paul, hardships actually made him better, not bitter. <laughs> you would think it would work the other way. Like you'd be a bitter Christian after all this time serving Jesus and I'm still dealing with all this opposition. But that's what we think when we meet bitter Christians. Like they've just, they've just had it hard. Like, man, they must have had it hard. That, man, they're bitter. They must have really been persevering, serving the Lord all this time, and now they're just bitter, and we give them a pass. But, but, but Paul had a different perspective. He, he didn't see any of the sufferings or the persecutions producing a bitterness. They made him better. They, they produced something better within him. He was better as a result of the hardships he faced. He, he found joy in the suffering. He found in the midst of the persecution a, a, a potential for God to do something. Without the persecution, it could not be done. It's easy to fall into that trap. And what we see is, in other words, Paul's hardships, they propelled him towards his purpose. Because what had actually worked to prevent Paul wasn't his seeming failures, it was his apparent successes. Well, let me show it to you because in verse 4 we find him revealing some of his successes. Check it out with me again. It's on the screen. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day. Now, I've got to pause there and say that's a really weird flex. I'm just going to say it. I don't know how that falls into the list of successes in life. That, hey, by the way, let me give you my resume on the eighth day. <laughs> Strange. But apparently in Jewish custom, that's a flex, okay? On the eighth day, circumcised of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, Pharisee, as to zeal, persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul has given his successes in his past. Now, what you might be forgiven for missing on your first past at this passage is the fact that Paul is purposefully here playing the game. He's playing the game that we Christians often play, which is called the comparison game. You know, the, the game where we play, where we compare ourselves against other believers, and we kind of assess where they're at in life, and their walk with God, and we kind of measure our progress against theirs. That's, that's what Paul's doing here. He, he's, he's playing, that's actually one of the most toxic traits of a lazy believer is is measuring yourself against others rather than considering your progress against your own calling. You know, where you, where, where you and don't, don't act like this is foreign to you. you, you do it against your spouse. Didn't see you read your word today. <laughs> okay, Pope. <laughs> but you do it like, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not doing as bad as them. This, this, is, this is what Paul's saying. He, he's presenting a list of, successes, and he's playing the comparison game. He's like, look, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna boast in the flesh, but if I did, this is what I bring to the table. Like, I'm the best, the best there is. And, and the reality is, what he wants to do is he wants to confront the notion of you comparing your progress against somebody else. He's not saying don't compare your progress. He's saying compare it against your calling not against others. Check it out because he goes on to highlight it, draw a healthy comparison in verse 12. He says, now, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make my own, make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. In other words, I'm not where I was, but I'm also not where I wanna be. There's a tension Paul is presenting this tension that you have in the Christian faith where you look back over your life and a healthy assessment is, well, well, at least I'm not there anymore. Can someone just encourage themselves in the Lord? At least you're not there anymore. 
Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, like where you were to where you are, at least you, you might not be where you know you want to be, but at least I'm not there. I'm making some ground. I may not be making ground at the pace I hoped I made because I still circle the same problems. I still yell at my kids. I still yell at my husband. I still, you know, whatever you do, I'm not there yet, but I'm not, as, I'm not where I was. Paul says this is actually a healthy comparison to take stock in my progress, to assess my growth, to consider where I'm at against my own calling in Christ Jesus. This is what Paul presents, and it's a healthy approach to our calling. It, it, it's, it's, it comes from when we feel friction in our faith. Anybody ever felt that? Some friction in faith. I learned this of a, of a counselor who was talking about marriage counseling. He had this couple coming in, and, and, and it seemed like a complex situation because she just kept wanting her husband to change. And, and his argument was, I'm the same person she married. She married me, the same person she married. And the only way that the counselor could illustrate it to the couple was to get two pieces of wood, hold them together, rep representing two people, and he quickly moved one piece of wood backward, and it caused friction. He, he moved the other piece of wood forward, and it caused friction. He's like, the only way to not have friction is for you to both move forward together. This, this is what we do. We expect that we're not going to have friction in our faith, yet I'm paused in my faith. I've paused in my progress. I've camped here. I found myself in a place where I'm good, God. I'm gonna do my one daily reading, maybe pray.com just one time a, a week and then I'll be fine. No, 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 God's like, I, 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 I'm moving forward by my spirit, but you've stayed still. That's why there's friction. That's why there's friction. Are you with me, church? Paul's solution is press. It's a simple solution. He says, church, Press, press. He says, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what, listen to the language, straining. Can you listen? It's not, it's not just casually leaning forward. It's not just looking forward. He's straining for, anybody know what it means to strain? Just he, he, the, the language, straining forward ahead, I Press on toward the goal for the prize. Do not miss the language that Paul selects to use to illustrate the Christian life. Paul's being strategic here. He's not just being uh, flowery or poetic. He's being strategic to illustrate what this Christian life looks like. Now, I know this is not gonna be a popular sermon to preach on Mother's Day. What's better sermon to preach on Mother's Day is a grace message. It's all God. It's all God. Now, don't worry. I'm a grace guy. I love grace. I'm not talking about salvation through works. I'm talking about now that you're saved, put it to work. This is what Paul is trying to get the church to get out of that stagnation zone, to get out of that toxic place where, you know what's interesting is I watch a lot of Bear Grylls and uh, I learned a thing or two on Bear Grylls because you've got to be ready in a wilderness situation to survive. All of you would die, but I would survive because I watched <laughs> Bear Grylls. And at a bare basic level, I realized and learned that if you're thirsty, drink from flowing water. Just at least, doesn't mean it's good for you, but at least make sure it's flowing. Because as long as water's flowing, it's healthy. When water sits, it stagnates. And gets toxic. That's like the believer. When you start sitting for too long, you get stagnant and toxic and wonder why. I gotta get some flow back. Get some flow back. Get some flow back. Get some flow. That's so what Paul's trying to do. He's trying to say, hey, we've got we gotta, we gotta press. We've got to press. Forgetting what lies behind. Forgetting what lies behind. P please keep in mind that the Bible's in Bible terminology. To forget does not mean to fail to remember. I gotta, I gotta really teach you this point because it could be confusing. No mature person, no healthy person can forget what happened in their past. Maybe we wish we could erase certain bad memories, but we can't. To forget in the Bible actually means to no longer be influenced or affected by it. So, so when you see God promise in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17, that their sins and iniquities, I will remember no more. He's not suggesting that he will conveniently get a bad memory. That's impossible for God. 
What God is actually saying is I will no longer hold their sins against them and their sins will no longer affect their standing with me. God can't forget. And you don't want God to forget because if God forget, it would water down grace. It's again the backdrop of, backdrop of what we did that he forgave us that gives the potency to the grace. But the potency of grace is that I'm not gonna forget, but I will not count it against you. So forgetting those things which are behind does not suggest that that impossible feat of mental or psychological gymnastics by which we try to erase the mistakes of our past. It simply means that we break the power of the past by living for the future. We can't change the past, but we can change its intended purpose. Uh, let, let me rephrase it. Uh, the past can be painful, but not as painful if you put purpose to it. The front rows help me. Uh, the past can often be painful, but it's less painful when there's purpose to it. Meaning if I just leave it in the pain category, it's always be pain. But if I use it to help somebody through their trouble or their trial, then my pain had purpose. And therefore the pain is eased a little bit. Mm. It's done through pressing, straining forward. It's called, it's a language of applied effort. You see, the Christian life is not a lazy river that we float down gently. It's not, it's not just something we relax in, you know, go deeper into the river. <laughs> go deeper in the river. You ever heard that preaching? <laughs> Come into the river. The waters, we, preachers say weird stuff, weird stuff. <laughs> Paul presents it as a race. That's what he says. It's a race with a prize. Because truly the, what hinders the Christian's calling it's not opposition, it's that stagnation. This is, this is what believers must be on their guard against is uh, life getting too easy. Oh, this is such a hard word to preach, but I hear it all the time. I, I, hear, I hear it uh, with, with, with young families, you know, you, you start adding kids into the mix and you're like, wow, man, getting to Sunday's hard, pastor, it's tough. It's not like these no kids folk. Some of you, I, I know you. You rock up with Starbucks, you know, <laughs> to church. It's like you just, you got dressed like 30 minutes before and you rock up and you're like, mm, well, I wonder what God's got for us today. You know, the, <laughs> the families, man, they've, they've been up since like dawn getting, <laughs> getting dressed and redressed. And then they finally got their outfit, looked at their kids and like, now we're gonna change your outfit. And they just drag them into church, get them into royal kids, take one breath and realize I'm late for service, then come in, lift their hands, I exalt thee. Like it's a genuine worship. It's genuine. It's through tears. I exalt thee. See, see parents and kids want the service to go longer, just keep them. I'm exalt. It's the Starbucks drinking no kids that are there like, I wonder how long pastor's gonna be today. <laughs> I got brunch plans and then I might, you know, yeah, pamper myself, do something, nails. It's hard, pastor. You know what I always say to parents and say it's hard, I'm like, you're welcome. And I'm not because I'm being arrogant, but because there's a gift in that. There's a gift in that. Like, they absolutely gonna hate me for this, but the Freeds are like my heroes because they moved two and a half hours away and they literally, I actually said, maybe you should find another church because it's a long way. I, I suggested that and they said, are you crazy, Pastor? Two and a half hours, it's only two and a half hours. It's only two and a half hours. They drive every Sunday. Two and a half hours. Some of us drive two and a half minutes and late. These guys are like early. They, and they, they run a farm. And they shave the kids, I mean, shave the lambs and <laughs> bathe the kids and do stuff and then come to church. But what a gift. The opposition produces a purity of worship. The opposition I ain't taking this casually. There's no casual approach to this. Man, this is a great preacher's a great word. Even Paul as an apostle said he had to press. Consider that for a moment. This is the apostle. This is the apostle. Like he's, he's like right at the top of his game. There's, there's not much more than apostleship. 
planted some churches, got a great resume, and now he's in prison for preaching. That's almost like a status. That's like a badge. And, and, and yeah, he's like, yeah, I got some work to do. I've still got a way to go. He's like, I ain't there yet. Like for anybody who could say they've arrived, that would be Paul. But Paul said, I've still got a way to go. I, not that I'm perfect, not that I've arrived. I'm still pressing towards the goal. This is a crazy notion from the apostle. You ever heard that, that phrase, let go and let God? Anybody heard that? Maybe seen it on a t-shirt? Sounds good, it's theologically incorrect. It's, it's like Jesus take the wheel. Now I know you've said it when your kids are crazy. Lord, take the wheel. I, I know you've said it, but it, it's incorrect. Don't preach that. Because Jesus said, I give you the keys of the kingdom. He's like, I want you to take the wheel. I put my spirit in you. It's a partnership. In fact, let me prove it to you. Let's get some scriptures up here. Real quick, over here, we've got Paul talking about partnership and the power of partnership in Philippians chapter one. If we could put that up here, he says this, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, talking to the church, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with, all, with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Let's go to the next chapter. He emphasizes again. He says, therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but more, much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Paul's saying, hey, God put it in you, but you've got to work it out of you. God put it in you, you gotta get it out of you. You gotta put it to work. It's a partnership. Let's look at Jesus, the way Jesus talks about partnership. In John 15, 5, He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. Don't get it twisted. You can't do this on your own. On your own, useless. But with me, fruitful. It's a partnership. God's looking for us to be partners in this mission. What a privilege that is to be partners with Christ, to be partners in His plan. Jesus makes it clear that God works in us so that He might work through us. I wonder how many of us still have a faith where it's God work for us. I'm not trying to do the conviction here. You've got to ask yourself, participating in this sermon, you gotta ask yourself, am I actually asking God to work in me so He can work through me or am I still asking God to work for me? Be honest with yourself. Have we matured in our faith that we still, I know where I was, I'm a little, but I've still got a way to go. Am I asking God work in me to work through me or am I still asking God to work for me? For, for me. For me. Any partnership, in any partnership, you name the partnership, it works the same. In any partnership, when one part isn't working, the other part becomes weight. This is the case for business or marriage. If you're in a business relationship, you might have a business partner. And at the conception of the business, things were working well. You're both fired up. Maybe one brought the brains, one brought the finances, whatever the deal was, but as the business grows, maybe one becomes disengaged, that partner becomes weight. When they stop working, they become weight. It's the same in a marriage. You need two people working towards the marriage. When one stops working, they become dead weight in the marriage. I wonder what our walk looks like at times. And trust me, God's still working. He's still working miracles. He's still working through your life. He's still working blessings into your life. But Paul is compelling the church to, to press. He calls it, applied effort. He's not saying that we attain heaven by our own efforts. This isn't an issue of heaven. He is, however, suggesting that the same way an athlete is rewarded for their performance, so the faithful believer is crowned when Jesus Christ returns. There is a prize. Not everyone wins. There is a prize. I like the way it's phrased in verse 14 at the end. He says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of Christ Jesus. I love that. It's an upward call. It's not a downward call. It's an upward. God's calling you higher. He's elevating you. He's like, hey, this is gonna, anybody ever walked uphill? Yeah. 
I just assumed 100% participation and half of you were like, no, never. <laughs> Not a trick. I'm just asking. Have you walked uphill? You would know your heart rate gets elevated. It's harder to go uphill. God has given us an uphill calling. It's an upward calling. It's going to require some effort. It doesn't come easy, but it's worth it. It's worth it. It's an upward calling. Here's, here's the cool part. While your calling requires you to press, you're simply pressing into your own potential. Let, let me repeat it for you because you missed it. This is the clincher. While your calling requires you to press, you're simply pressing into your own potential. Because Paul puts it this way in verse 16, only let us hold true to what we have already attained. It's, it's an upward call, but what God is calling you to isn't impossible. It's not beyond you. He's calling you to who He's called you to be. See, the way God sees you, He doesn't just see you the way He sees you. He loves you the way you are, but He sees you with His gifts and talents and purpose being outworked in your life. He sees you from an elevated perspective. He doesn't see you as barely in the kingdom. He sees you as royal. He sees you as, a, as someone who has a high calling, an upward calling, and He keeps drawing you into that. But sometimes we stay stagnant working against God. God's trying to draw us and we're trying to work against God. God's trying to draw us. He's like, would you just partner with me and press a little bit? So as I'm pulling you into the presence of God, it's not going to be this resistance like skidding along, you actually might press with God. Accelerate the purpose of God in your life.